come. But let's go straight to our first guest uh, from Young Voices UK, Jason Reed. Good evening, Jason. Good evening, Kevin. Uh, can we first have a little listen uh, to our Prime Minister? He was in fine form on a number of fronts uh, today. Uh, so let's endure Boris for just a couple of minutes. Here in the northeast, Nissan has decided to make an enormous bet on new electric vehicles. And together with Envision, there is now a massive new gigafactory for, for batteries. And around the world, these cars are getting ever more affordable with fantastic uh, broadband. Uh, 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 forgive me. Yesterday I went, uh, as, as we all must, uh, uh, to, to Peppa Pig World. I don't know if you've been to Peppa Pig World. Who's been to, hands up anybody who's been to Peppa Pig World? <laughs> Not enough. Well, uh, Jason, uh, do we have uh, cause to uh, fear for the sanity of our Prime Minister at the moment? Seems to be losing it a bit, doesn't he? I think he does. I thought it was only the Americans who have this problem with their 95-year-old president, but it seems we do as well. There was an amazing interview he did afterwards where the journalist said to him, are you all right? Is everything okay? Do we need to, do we need to call someone for you? Um, and that's the feeling you get when you listen back to him completely losing his mind in that speech, fumbling with the paper and rambling about Peppa Pig world, sounding like he's completely lost his mind. In 2019, he was given the biggest gift imaginable by Jeremy Corbyn with that big majority, which uh, no party has overcome an electoral deficit of that kind in one election cycle in many, many decades. Um, but if anyone can lose the next election and lose such a big majority, I think it is Boris. And that would be that would be incredible. That would make him go down in history as one of the most incompetent prime ministers alongside, I think, Neville Chamberlain. Uh, extraordinary, yes. Uh, and in amongst that bungling, bumbling incoherence uh, was, of course, a more green claptrap. Uh, the message that all new buildings will have charging points for electric cars uh, as of next year uh, in the latest bid to boost climate change, the battle against climate change and on and on it goes. Uh, he, we heard him there saying, oh, uh, electric cars are getting cheaper. Well, uh, I'm sorry to inform uh, the uh, extremely well off prime minister, but for the average person, electric cars are still beyond financial reach. So uh, it's to, to its parallel universes, isn't it? It's what uh, affluent politicians believe uh, this country is like and the reality of what it's like. Uh, most people can't afford electric cars, so we don't really need electric points to be uh, installed in all new buildings. In the aftermath of uh, COP26, the virtue signalling environmental first of madness, Boris Johnson is desperate to have something to show other world leaders so that he can keep calling Britain world leading in this area and in every other area. And so this is what he's come up with, this idea of uh, mandating electric car charging points in every new building and in every major renovation of existing buildings as well. Uh, but exactly as you say, it won't, it won't make much of a difference. I think if electric vehicles were such a good idea and it was so inevitable as the government seems to think that we're all going to make the switch, then this kind of move wouldn't be necessary. If that was the case, then everyone would put electric charging points in their in their buildings anyway. The fact that the government feels the need to mandate it, I think, gives the game away. It suggests that they know that it's not going to be as simple as they are making out. And the price issue, as you say, is uh, very significant. The government, of course, likes to subsidise uh, electric cars for it to the tune of a few thousand pounds, no matter how rich you are. So next time you see a smug banker driving his Tesla alongside you. Yeah. Don't forget that you paid for that car. You, you did say banker then, didn't you? Yes. Um, but uh, yes, point taken. And when is uh, the Prime Minister going to get the message that uh, obsessed though he is with his green industrial revolution, uh, most of the population couldn't give a rat's backside about it. Uh, he was droning on uh, again in that incoherent speech about how his uh, floating green windmills and the like uh, would inspire and uh, bring in uh, 90 billion pounds worth of private investment. I mean, he's just plucking these numbers out of the air, isn't he? He is. He makes it up as he goes along, as do many politicians around the world when it comes to this kind of issue, because an issue like climate change is so enormous and so complex and it stretches so far into the future that you can't 
have the solutions to it today that these politicians want to have for political reasons so that they can do their convenient virtue signaling. And so when he talks about wind farms, that's just to generate a few hopefully nice headlines for him. But even Boris knows full well that this is not going to solve the issue of climate change if you really wanted to solve um, Britain's energy woes, you would be looking to nuclear energy, you'd be looking to shale gas prospecting, as we've talked about before, wind farms are never going to power the world. Everybody knows that, but Boris doesn't care, because by the time this becomes an issue, he won't be prime minister anymore. That's true. Uh, that's a, well, That was the joke of COP26, wasn't it? A bunch of world leaders making deals about what their countries were going to do in 2070 and 2060 and 2050. None of them will be world leaders then. Uh, and uh, most of their, all of their countries almost certainly won't stick to the deals they're making. It's a strange fantasy world they all live in right now. Uh, talking of which, uh, the fantasy that somehow or other Pretty Patel or this government uh, is ever going to clo uh, solve the migrant channel crossing crisis uh, continues apace. Uh, the new initiative is that uh, a government review uh, will look at how to stop the migrants crossing the English channel uh, with the possibility they may set up a whole new department uh, to try to stop these migrants coming across. So far 24,700 have arrived in the UK this year three times more than last year uh, this is more hot air. Uh, when is the government going to get a grip on this crisis? Because I don't see it happening anytime soon, do you? I don't think they ever will. I, I find this story quite funny, really. They've tasked poor old Steve Barclay with the task of finding new ways to uh, stop migrant boats reaching the shores. I don't know how he's supposed to do that when the French authorities keep letting them through. Are we going to revive the idea of a wave machine to somehow push them back onto the French shores? Maybe we could put up a sign telling them there's a big nuclear spill in Kent in the hope that they turn their boats around. I don't know what you're supposed to do. Yeah, well, do you remember Pretty's, uh, one of her plans was to have giant boats with huge nets that she would dangle into the channel and you would sort of <laughs> pluck the dinghies out of the sea. I mean, some of the plans have been absolutely crazy. Uh, she's got her borders and my immigration bill coming uh, through the house fairly soon. Uh, I was reading today that, for example, this is the, the crackdown. This is what's going to stop all the migrants. Uh, one of the clauses uh, is that uh, instead of uh, at the moment when they apply for uh, political asylum, when they seek asylum, Essentially, that is a ticket to be allowed to stay here uh, forever, as we found out in the case of the Liverpool bomber, seven years and counting, uh, even though he had been turned down in 2014. Uh, well, in her tough new bill, uh, this will mean that they can't stay here forever, but they can stay here for 30 months. I mean, it's not exactly draconian, is it? There aren't many areas where I feel sorry for the government, but to be honest, this is... One of them, there has of course been staggering incompetence, but the, the fault for this issue lies at the door of the French. There's some staggering plankery from the French government, their inability or unwillingness to stop uh, any substantial numbers of these boats crossing the channel to do anything to stop the horrendous people trafficking gangs who smuggle people onto those unsafe boats in huge numbers and lead to people drowning. Uh, of course, we know that President Emmanuel Macron has an election coming up next year and it's the oldest trick in the book for the French when they have an election coming up to pick a fight with the British. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the reason why we've got this crisis. I'm afraid it is the French's fault. And until they pull uh, I mean, you're out, right, Jason, but uh, we've got to go in just a second. But just before you do go, the problem with that, we cannot predicate solving the migrant crisis on the cooperation of the French, because it's just not going to happen. They will never play their part in stopping this. So if we really want to stop it, it's going to have to be us. We're going to have to do something about the dysfunctional asylum system that Priti Patel spoke about last week as if it's got nothing to do with her. She's in charge of it. She needs to do something about it. We need to make this country uh, less of a soft touch, uh, less attractive to these people. We've got to do something ourselves. Just moaning about the French while legitimate uh, is not going to solve the crisis because they're never going to do their bit. We do need to do something radical if we're going to change um, this kind of situation, but I don't know what that looks like without the cooperation of the French. There was the idea uh, floated that we were going to 
um, ship migrants off to be processed in Albania in the hope that a long bureaucratic wait would deter them. But then uh, within hours of that story being published in the newspapers, the Albanian ambassador came out to deny it in the strongest possible terms. Maybe Steve Barclay will surprise us with this review and come up with some solution that doesn't cost, that doesn't involve sending huge amounts of money across the channel to the French and relying on them. But I think it's unlikely. I don't think there's a solution around the corner for this. Yes, there was a disappointing early response from the Albanians when uh, we announced that we were thinking of setting up a migrants centre in Albania. They said we haven't heard anything about this, uh, which wasn't very encouraging. Uh, but uh, just another day in the life of our useless battle against the migrant crisis. Good to talk, Jason. Let's talk again soon. Jason Reed, head of the Young Voices UK.